Cold Storage Solutions Inc. is a uh, refrigerated trucking company, a uh, public cold storage company, and a grocery wholesaler uh, here on Vancouver Island. Uh, I started the company, or my wife and I started it. I always have to put that in there because it wouldn't happen without her. But my wife Jennifer and I started it uh, in January of 2000. Um, with the idea of changing the way food is handled on Vancouver Island. Getting product across the water is very expensive. Um, and so back in those days, uh, trucking companies used to get pretty creative uh, on how they handle product coming across the water uh, in order to keep costs down. Uh, I didn't like how that was uh, being done. So we started a company um, to, to change that and fix a lot of those problems. Um, and uh, we started as a third party uh, trucking company only and then as we've diversified over the years um, and we've added all these other elements like the cold storage and now grocery wholesale. So uh, we deliver to just about every uh, independent grocery uh, store on Vancouver Island all the way from uh, Port Hardy to Yakula, Tofino and all the Gulf Islands every day. We move uh, on a nightly basis. Uh, we probably, uh, on average, bring about 800,000 to a million pounds of food across the water every day. I'm very committed to the natural gas uh, side of things, uh, or have been, I should say, um, just because at the time, um, that was the best technology that was out there. So, um, so we have 25 of our uh, 35 trucks running on natural gas. I'm very happy with that. When I went to purchase some more trucks uh, about a year ago, um, we can't get any. We can't get any diesel trucks, we can't get any CNG trucks. The manufacturers have got such a backlog that we're dead in the water right now. And so we needed, you know, we're a trucking company, we need to buy new equipment. So through that process, I started exploring what else is out there. And I stumbled upon, oh, and, and uh, I'll back up a little bit, part of my frustration um, with not being able to get CNG trucks or diesel trucks is everything's manufactured in the United States. Nothing's built here in Canada. And that really is upsetting me because, um, you know, as a small Canadian company trying to buy a truck, a U.S. Uh, manufacturer isn't even going to take my phone call, never mind, um, you know, taking me seriously. So, um, so I found that very, very frustrating. Um, and through some discussions with some U.S. carriers that aren't having any problems getting trucks, I, I got frustrated. So I started looking for what's in Canada, how can we uh, you know, support that technology, and that's when I stumbled upon Lion Electric. And Lion Electric uh, building their electric trucks out of Montreal, I thought, okay, this is very interesting. Flew out there, met with them love what they're doing um, and then through the process you know was able to connect with Forgon Leclerc uh, to build a truck body out of Montreal as well and then uh, met with Steve uh, who owns Volta Air in Richmond who's built an all-electric refrigerated uh, unit um, that could be mounted onto this truck and what I got excited about is that you know a year ago if we could pull this off we're going to build an all-electric a uh, refrigerated cargo truck that's 100% built in Canada. And that's what got me, you know, hyped up. And I said, we got to figure this out. Uh, it's taken a lot of work and a lot of energy and a lot of trips back and forth um, to get this done. But uh, now, as you, as you see, we, we made it happen. And we've got the first all electric uh, refrigerated truck in Canada running down the road. I tend to, uh, you know, see a problem and then go, you know, I think there's a way to solve this. Um, and so I can be a bit um, tenacious, I guess. Uh, so I'll call up these guys and say, I want to do this. They will blow me off and say, yeah, we don't do that. And then I'll call them back and, but you should. And, you know, and what I found is, well, I can tell you when I finally got everybody in a room um, to try and design this truck, the first thing I said is we're not going to worry about money. I said, because if you're all sitting there trying to keep this as cheap as possible, um, we're never going to get anywhere. What we need to do is, can we get the technology to actually work? And then we'll figure out the money part. And as soon as I saw light bulbs turn on at that moment, and it wasn't that this is a license to print money. This is okay. This is not this isn't going to be done on the cheap. And so, um, and that was really exciting. And then at that point, people just sat at the table and said, well, if that's the case, then 
I think we could do this and then we could do that and and you know it all started to slowly come together but so the truck's expensive <laughs> um, but we've already seen how we've brought the price down you know with grants and things like that so yeah so I think it's it's about being um, what's the right word I guess it's about not saying uh, giving up and not uh, not uh, persistence know, persistence yeah you know I want to push that but at the same time being willing to say I'm willing to do my part too you know I'm not going to sit here and grind you on price and all that sort of stuff I'm part of this project so let's do it together and, and see where it ends up and if it works great if it doesn't well nothing venture nothing gains so never say never on anything because you don't know where the technology is going to go tomorrow so we were the very first ones to ever do 100% uh, compressed natural gas. At that time, the pushback that I was getting from the industry and, uh, you know, our own industry and stuff is that I was on glue. Why am I doing this? This is stupid. You know, all of that sort of stuff. And now it's quite the norm. Um, but, you know, I don't know what technology is around the corner. So I want to keep our staff uh, and, um, and everyone involved in Cold Star looking for those opportunities and then decide, okay, let's explore that, let's not. Right now, electric uh, for certain applications is fantastic. So, okay, well, for those applications, um, we'll keep exploring. We can get about 10 hours out of it or a range of 228 kilometers. Uh, so it's good for, for you know, in town. Um, to charge it, it's really, really easy. Our charging station's over there. Uh, it only takes about four hours to charge from, you know, wherever it is to, to fully charged. Uh, I've, I've, I've only gotten it down to about, like I said, 38%, which was, and it had a range of 78 or 80 kilometers. Okay, so once we start it up, this, and it's ready to go, this electric light will uh, start up. Mm -hmm. And then, Turn the key. Now it's running. What's that green light turns on? This is my reefer. So oh, when okay. I turn this on, it's loading. Right. And then I just hit the power. Right. And that's and then it's going. Right. You can turn that off. And these are the reefer the, as well? No, these are the for the front of the cab right to lift it up to give it that cushion ride. Oh okay. So this is the front of the cab and this is the back of the cab. Just that smooth. That smooth and that quiet. And it tells me right here on the dash how much power I'm using. Right. Once we go over 30 kilometers, that white noise will go away mm -hmm. for when we're in parking lots or yeah. in downtown, not moving very fast where people might be crossing mm -hmm. or, you know, cyclists or you know people who are hard of hearing so the solar panels on the roof what are they um powering they are helping with uh the power for the reefer i believe right okay because i think the the battery pack for the reefer and the tailgate aren't aren't, done, uh, aren't enough to can do them both so like, people make the whole thing about electric trucks, oh, they're too complicated, they're going to be too difficult. It's like, mm, I don't think so. I think it's that whole, it's new and it's scary yeah. and, and you don't know if it, it'll last. Everywhere I've, I've been pretty much, everybody's wanted to talk about it or ask me about it. Right. Quite often, quite often have people in electric vehicles driving by me, honking, <laughs> giving me the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then... You know, if we're at, a, at a, a light, they'll roll down their window and they'll ask, you know, is it really 100% or yeah. <laughs> electric? And I'm like, yes. On one side, is it really the government's, <coughs> excuse me, the government's responsibility um, to make it so business is, is successful? I'm not so sure. But when you're looking at new technology and, uh, you know, and how we can make a difference in our society, then I do think it's good for the government to kick in um, and help. 
But where's that balance? I mean, you know, when I'm wearing my my financial hat of the business, I, I want as much money and grants as, as I can possibly get, reduces the risk to the business. Uh, it does encourage faster adoption. Uh, absolutely, without a doubt. Anytime you can take some of that risk away. Um, but at what point is it too much and not enough? I, I that's, a, that's why I don't get in, or I'm not in politics, but, um, but the grants that do um, or that are available, they've got to streamline it. They've got to make it so it's user friendly, um, and that companies can um, can go through that process um, and actually see the funds. So the simplest thing for a trucking company right now is to buy a diesel truck and run a diesel truck down the road. We know the costs of, involved in that. We have all the infrastructure in place. There's tons of infrastructure to fuel. Um, our drivers are all trained on it. That's the simple thing. It's not the right thing, but it's the simple thing. So if you're turning around and saying to an owner of a company, especially smaller companies, we want you to pay double the price for a truck. We've we got to figure out all this infrastructure and stuff, and we're, you're going to have to train all your staff differently and all of that sort of thing. But it's really good for the environment. It's going to be great. You know, when you're weighing that out versus and, and still trying to run your business and there's a million other challenges in the business, uh, you know, that you have, really, is that where you're going to spend your energy? Covering it, it has to play a role, absolutely. But I don't want people sitting here thinking that um, Kelly wants the government to pay for everything and, um, and wouldn't that be great? It would be, but it's not realistic. So the carbon fuel tax right now is is the biggest thing that gets my blood boiling. So you're penalizing me for burning fuel um, and taxing me more. I've got to move 45,000 pounds of chicken from Vancouver to you know, Vancouver Island to feed people. We buy all the, you know, the GPS tracking. We have routes, uh, routing software. We're doing that as efficiently as humanly possible but I still got to burn fuel to do it. And then you tax me on that. That really bothers me. So what I, but if you're going to do that, then why not um, give me, say I pay $80,000 a year in carbon tax. I should have that pot. And at the end of the year, I should be able to say that $80,000, if I want to buy an electric truck, I get that money, which is technically my money, and I can put it towards an electric truck. And, uh, and, and, and if I don't buy an electric truck, then the government gets to keep it, whatever. But, you know, why don't we have stuff like that? Um, so that's true encouragement. And as they keep putting out these grants that say you can apply for the grant and uh, March 1st, but you have to have the truck in service by March 31st yeah. and stuff like that. It's, it's anywhere from a year to 18 months to get a piece of equipment. But I can't put a PO in to guarantee that I'm going to buy this truck unless I know I've got the grant. So, you know, it, it, so I need to be able to apply for the grant and know that I've got two years to use that grant. Um, and then I now I feel comfortable that I can go and buy an electric truck because I know I'm going to have the grant. The way it is right now, I put out, you know, the money to buy this truck and then cross my fingers and hope that I'm going to get some help in that. Most companies will never do that. And until they, they can pre-approve you, um, and that's not how the system works. You have to show them the registration, the serial number of the truck, the bill of lading, all, or, or the bill of sale, all that stuff, then you get the grant. Well, nobody's doing it. That, you've just slowed down the rate of adoption. So the, the one area that I never talk about that I probably should is how how do I see us getting more of our staff involved in green technology? And I haven't answered, I don't have the answer for that myself. I can't get our staff to get excited about stuff ahead of the, the trucks coming. Like if I sit down with a whole bunch of staff and say, what do you think we should do next? You can hear crickets. But once, once I say we're doing an electric truck, then, and, and here it is, then people get excited about it. So I don't know how to, I don't know how to get people more jazzed up about, it. like somebody like you, if you were my operations manager, but you're this passionate about electric vehicles, I would love that, or, or a, solar and all that sort of stuff. Somebody that's willing to get as excited about it as I do, 
would be very helpful. So how do I train the staff to start thinking like that? We have 175 staff and all the, as far as I know, all they're doing is coming to work, doing their job. They do a great job at it, but they're not, they're not looking into the future that way and stuff. So how do I, how do I change that culture?